I'm Jonathan Edelheit, and our presentation this morning is Healthcare Reform's on Effect on Medical Tourism. This is really an important topic. Um, there's not a lot of information out there on how healthcare reform affects medical tourism or what some of the different elements of healthcare reform are, and we're going to kind of go through that. So, obviously, in June 28, 2012, the Supreme Court upheld the health care reform law, and I think it really shook the U.S. insurance industry, both employers, agents, HR professionals were all very surprised that it actually was passed. They thought it could be, uh, that they thought it was going to be struck down or the individual mandate would have been struck down. Many in the medical tourism industry were not sure of what it meant. There's a lot of misinformation out there. And most Americans really don't know what it means. When it was passed, it was kind of a shell. Um, where they passed a law and they basically said they'd come out with most of the information later on what benefits would be covered, what wouldn't be covered, and how it would work. And a lot of the Americans that I talk to, when I ask them what does health care reform mean to them, they basically either tell me it's free health care or it means they're going to get free surgeries. So what did health care reform really do? Um, it really didn't reform. Uh, it, it didn't reform medical malpractice and tort reform. It didn't reform medical supply and equipment costs. It didn't reform pharmaceutical costs or m really reform any major cost elements of why the cost of, is, is expensive for insurance and health care. Um, and if you can imagine, the health care reform law is almost 3,000 pages. There's almost 13,000 pages of regulations. And the IRS, Health and Human Services, and many other agencies haven't even really gotten started yet. There are about 180 government committees, bureaus, commissions, and boards within different agencies involved in providing the rules, regulation, and interpretations, and enforcement of the law. So a lot of bureaucracy. And if we have 13,000 pages of regulations, and this is months ago, how many pages of regulations are there going to be starting in 2014? You know, is there going to be less than 100,000? Is there going to be more than 100,000? Is there going to be a million pages of regulations with 180 different, you know, interagency committees? Um, and I always ask, should you be scared if you're a USHR professional or agent? And I would say yes. Um, that's, that's a lot to stay on top of. It's almost impossible. So really, the expected effect on medical tourism, it's going to drive more U.S. insurance companies and employers to look at implementing it for cost savings. Um, there's going to be potentially longer waiting times um, and doctor shortages. There's already starting to be longer waiting times for certain, uh, to see certain doctors or specialists. More hospitals may pull out of Medicare. And Deloitte predicted that if health care reform passed, it'd be very positive for medical tourism. So if we look at what are some of the positives of health care reform, and when I give this presentation, um, this isn't something, that, you know, it's a non-political, um, you know, it's not against Obamacare, it's not for Romney care if it came in, um, you know, it's, it's really just examining the actual law because neither party has really presented anything um, that is really going to significantly affect and reduce health care costs. So some of the po positives of the health care reform law, the waiving of pre-existing condition causes. Um, obviously now sick people who couldn't get coverage before could. Um, I've had family members who have had conditions pre-exed. Um, the elimination of annual and lifetime limits. Um, so before there was a $1 million limit for the year or for a lifetime on their health insurance. Now it's unlimited. But obviously benef there's uh, benefits with repercussions. Um, you can't just expand health care benefits in the U.S. and think there's not a cost to it. I, I know that was pitched um, as health care reform was being proposed, that this is going to reduce costs, but it's just common sense. You know, if you go and you wanted to buy uh, a Toyota car and you wanted the low-end version versus one with leather seats and heated seats and the navigation system, it's not going to be cheaper. Um, and just because they produce more of them doesn't mean it's going to end up being cheaper than the one with cloth seats and no navigation system or satellite radio. <laughs> so it's just common sense and economics. So if we look at some high estimates of health care reform, and these are the extreme example of where health insurance costs could be by 2020. 
is individual health insurance could be almost 14,000, family could be close to 40,000, and these costs are not sustainable, and Americans really are not gonna be able to afford this in the future. So by 2014, insurers may no longer charge individuals and small businesses higher premiums or deny coverage on the basis of pre-existing condition. Um, so basically, healthy and sick people pay the same cost of insurance, but what that really means is if healthy and sick people pay the same cost, someone's sharing that burden of cost. So it means sick people's costs come down, and healthy costs, uh, people, people who are healthy, their costs come up. Obviously, I think most people know, but <laughs> in the beginning they were pushing a public option. There is no public option. They have health insurance exchanges, um, which will be created. Some are being created. Some states are saying they're refusing to create them. Uh, it mandates that all Americans purchase health insurance or pay a fine. The fine starts in 2014, but it's only $95. Um, in 2016, it goes up to about 695 but the $95 is, is less than $9 a month. And it's really a joke. Um, I, I don't know any other way to say it. It's, you know, $9 a month is not a penalty to force someone to buy health insurance, especially when some people are paying $500 to $1,000 a month for individual coverage, depending upon their sex, age, demographics, and if they're sick. <laughs> um, and what's crazy is just recently a deputy, it was reported about a couple months ago, a deputy IRS commissioner said the IRS isn't going to enforce, audit, or fine people. Um, the purpose of the individual mandate and the fine was if we find people for not buying insurance, everybody comes into, buys insurance and comes into the insurance pool and you have a spread of risk of young and old, healthy and sick. Um, but if it's weak mandate and the IRS isn't going to enforce it, it's as if no mandate exists. And therefore, you know, if, if you're a young person, why not just wait till you get sick to buy insurance because in 2014, as we discussed, it's guarantee issue. Um, and if anyone's had any questions, we're gonna uh, ask them at the end. So, obviously guarantees you know pre-ex is positive for people who could never get coverage before, um, but it needs to be tied to an individual mandate and fine that forces everyone to buy health insurance so that there's a spread of risk. So if we look at some examples of how some of these new clauses with pre-existing condition kind of destroys the concept of health insurance underwriting and causes adverse selection is there's actually almost an incentive under health care reform starting in 2014 for people to wait until they're sick to buy coverage. Um, you know, before I go into this example, uh, you know, because in, in my previous past, I ran a health insurance administrator for about nine years. And, you know, we, you know, I, I went out you know, did sales, did enrollment, and you know, we would tell people, you need to get this insurance. If you get sick, you're gonna get pre-exed, and as long as you're sick for a long, you know, if you're with a group, it could be a very long time before you're covered and you need this coverage. And about, I would say two months ago, I was sitting down with two employees who work for me who were in their early 20s, and I was repeating this conversation. I was saying, we provide coverage, you guys haven't elected for coverage. Um, you guys need this because if you get sick tomorrow or next month, they're not gonna cover your, uh, your condition. And then it hit me and I said, well, until January 1st, 2014, then you guys can go ahead and not buy insurance because the moment you find out that you're sick, you'll be guaranteed to buy it at the same cost uh, as you would before. So basically now for younger people, it's always been a challenge to get them to buy health insurance because they, um, they feel like they're invincible and they don't need it now there's no incentive for them to do it. They know they can buy it at any time. Um, so that's a real challenge if young people are dropping off the plan because they're needed in order to keep the cost down for um, older people. So if we look at another example <coughs> of how the guarantee issue and no pre -ex really doesn't encourage people to be healthy, if you have Joe who's 45 years old and he's paying $1,200 a month for this health insurance and he, uh, but he decides he doesn't want to pay for it, so he pays a $95 a month fine per year. And he knows when he gets sick, he can purchase it at any time. But Joe smokes a pack of cigarettes a day, drinks a liter of vodka every day. He eats fast food every single meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and he never exercises. And then you have Jane, she's the same age, she's 45, she's healthy, 
She's paying for her health insurance, which would be uh, 12, which is 1,200 a month. She exercises five times per week, eats healthy, doesn't drink, and doesn't smoke. So under health care reform, Jane and Joe's insurance premiums have to be the same. They consider that to be fair. So what does that mean? That means that Jane's insurance costs have to go up because of the fact that Joe is sitting out there living an unhealthy lifestyle waiting to get sick to come onto insurance. And they kind of have to meet in the middle. So as I was saying, with young people, they obviously feel they're young and invincible. Um, they can always buy it later. They don't want to spend the money on health insurance. And now they can be weighted and rewarded. And there's, uh, under health care reform, there's a new plan called the New Invincible Plan that allows for a high deductible plan for uh, younger Americans. Another example I'd like to give on how the guarantee issue, no pre-ex costs are the same as unfair, is if we, we look at an example outside of insurance. We look at somebody uh, dri driving car insurance. I'm sure all of you have auto insurance. And so give the same example. You have Jane. She drives a speed limit. She stops at every stop sign. She drives really safe. She doesn't talk on her cell phone while she's driving. And you have Joe, and he's been arrested five times for drinking under the influence. He's always uh, talking on his cell phone and texting. He speeds, and he's gotten into several accidents, and he doesn't stop at stop signs. And would you think that it would be fair, and it makes sense from an insurance underwriting perspective, that Jane and Joe basically pay the same cost for insurance? Um, and that's, you know, that's an example of what uh, this new system has done. If we look at some other examples of how they've changed rates, it's, it's mandated that elderly people be charged no more than three times the rate of a younger person. But from an actuarial standpoint, well, elderly people should be paid five to six times the price of a younger person. So what does this mean? This means the young and healthy are not just subsidizing people who are sick. Now, elderly people's insurance rates are being forced down artificially, and that means that the younger people, have, their rates have to increase to cover the costs um, of the elderly. So basically, younger people are getting hit twice. You know, they're paying for the sick and they're paying for the elderly. So what does this mean? Now the younger people have even a double incentive to drop off and, and not buy insurance, pay the fine, or if no one enforces it, don't pay it, and basically buy insurance when it comes up. So if you have an exodus of young people leaving the health insurance marketplace, obviously costs will go up. So really, this is just an example of we're just putting more bureaucracy under the current health care system. So obviously, some minor things that were done that increase costs is, you know, dependents are now allowed to stay on plans till they're 26. Um, you know, a lot of people think this is positive. Um, but obviously, if you allow people to stay on health insurance longer at the same rate, um, it's going to cost something. It's not free. When we look at, I talked before about the elimination of lifetime caps and annual limits, um, such as a plan that would have a million dollar limit you know, for the year, for the lifetime, and how th that is gone now. And insurance companies ha have to pay whatever the claims that are incurred. There's obviously a cost to this. And before I helped co-found the MTA and was running the healthcare administrator, we were going into employers, this is you know, s you know, eight years ago, who they no longer could afford the million dollar cap or even the half million. And they were still looking at how they could offer comprehensive coverage so they were looking at doing limits, some we put in place at 75,000, 250,000. Same benefits as a major medical, but there was a cap. Um, so obviously, you know, this is going to cause a tremendous amount of problems, a lot of these things, because it's going to really increase costs, and it eliminates a lot of these employers who are trying to do creative things to still offer benefits to their employees. And obviously, the major part of health care reform, you know, it was really health insurance reform is that insurers need to spend no less than 85% um, of their money on medical costs for groups and 80% for um, individuals. So they get to keep 15% for profits and admin on employer and group business and 20% on individual. Um, this is the major thing that happened under health care reform, but what no one talks about is there was a big focus on beating up the insurance companies 
while this law was trying to be passed. So it was looked at, it's a big win. Now they're limited as to how much money they can make. But if you extrapolate the percentage of, of revenue and profit they made you know, when this law was being passed and you look at where it's gonna be by 2020, that smaller percentage of 15 and 20 percent is actually going to be greater than what they were making in back in 2010 before the law passed because costs are going up. So it's actually potentially a really big win for the insurance companies. Um, and obviously it's a win for pharmaceutical and medical supply and equipment. So, you know, if we look at the health insur insurance exchanges, um, you know, states receive money from the federal government to set up these state exchanges for individuals to buy from and then eventually groups. Um, some states are refusing to, to implement them, um, whether it's because they don't think it's a good idea or it's just politics like Louisiana and Florida. Um, but it really doesn't matter because the federal government has basically said for any states who refuse to set up an exchange, we're just going to have a federal exchange individuals and eventually groups can access. So the exchanges are coming, some are already here. And whether it's a public exchange through the state or federal government, or it's a private exchange, there's private exchanges being built right now by the private marketplace, um, it's gonna happen. So some other elements to really understand healthcare reform is employers who have more than 50 full-time employees will be fined $2,000 if they don't start providing insurance in 2014, um, and, and this is, going to be a big problem for a lot of companies that have blue collar workers or who have not offered it before. Um, I know of an employer, you know, it was about two months ago that has 20,000 employees and they run like dollar stores and they don't provide benefits and they were looking at an over a 20 million dollar fine um, for not offering insurance anymore and they don't have that built into their business model. Um, so, you know, what ends up happening? Do they go out of business or most likely they'll probably shift the burden onto the consumer and I'm guessing raise prices to keep that business um, going. And there's a whole segment out there of companies that have limited medical, mini medical plans, low cost health insurance that they offer to blue collar workers that is incomprehensive. Um, and the problem now is if they're over 50 employees, <coughs> if they continue to offer that, they still have to pay for that, but they have to pay the $2,000 fine because they have to shift to a major medical plan. So. Full time, yes. Um, so basically, um, this is going to push a lot of employers probably uh, into the self-funded marketplace. There's, you know, obviously, you know, majority of employers who are large are self-funded now. But if you're self-funded, it's going to provide a little bit more flexibility in what you can do. And what they've also done, you know, obviously, is employers know how to how to work around some of these systems. So, you know, maybe they shift workers to a 1099 contractor. Um, maybe they make them part-time, but one of the things that uh, has happened is they've created a calculation where now any employee working over 30 hours a week will be considered part-time for the purposes of the calculation of the $2,000 fine, where before everyone considered it 40 hours per week. So for those employers who have part-time employees that hit that 30-hour threshold, there's, they have a big problem, and basically you, you, there's a mathematical equation of how you actually calculate that. And employers have to calculate it once a month. So it's an additional burden for employers because they have to calculate based upon all their employees what their potential fine is gonna be that month. Um, now, if healthcare reform uh, you know, stays as it is, which, which it most likely will, um, the problem is it could push more people into our healthcare system. Uh, I know that's what was, was marketed to us when this was, was running is more people will have access to insurance. But as I said, as rates go up and people know they can come on insurance at any time at the same cost, it, you know, that might not happen. You might actually have more people uninsured. But if more people come on the plan, um, we already are burdened. Our healthcare system is burdened here in the U.S. You know, there's already a doctor shortage. There's already a nursing shortage. And if we look at some of the statistics from an American Hospital Association survey, is just with the baby boomers, there's gonna be a huge crush on our healthcare system where there's not enough supply and gonna to be too much demand. One out of every three baby boomers um, will be obese. Uh, more than six out of every 10 will be dealing with a chronic condition. And eight times more knee replacements will be performed in 2030 than today. So there won't be enough doctors to do some of those orthopedic procedures. 
Now, this is one of my favorite slides because I think this shows also the problems of the U.S. healthcare system. It's a little cartoon, and if you can't read it, um, the guard's reading an article that says prisoner entitled, uh, prisoners entitled to private health care, and then the person saying my motive for pleading guilty hip replacement. So, you know, it seems absurd, right? Um, but we actually covered in my health care reform magazine and medical tourism magazine, this actually happened, I think it was last year or the uh, year before, is someone needed a major procedure and they couldn't afford it and they couldn't afford health insurance and they walked into the bank and they handed the note to a teller and basically said they were robbing the bank and they wanted a dollar. And then they waited for the police to come and arrest them. And it was specifically so they could get free care in jail for the surgery. And the sad part about the article was it said that he would be in, in jail, I, I forget the time, but it was like a year, and it would have to be like 14 months before he gets the surgery. So he was getting sent to prison and he wouldn't even get the opportunity to get the free surgery for what he did. He did the whole thing for. Um, so uh, as we were talking about the $2,000 fine, um, I think for some employers, uh, they're going to say, you know what, why, why deal with insurance anymore? Costs are going up. The administrative um, compliance and complying with all the rules and the, you know, w whatever it's eventually going to be, 100,000 pages, is too much. It's not worth it. Um, they could just say, here, there's your $2,000 fine um, to the you know, U.S. government, and you guys just figure it out on your own. Um, because if they're paying for insurance for their employees, that could be seven or twelve thousand dollars a year. So you know that's the thing that employers are going to be challenged with in the future. Do I pay the seven to twelve thousand dollars, or do I just say let me pay a two thousand dollar fine and let the employee figure it out on their own? Two thousand per full time employee. Yes, um, you have to be over fifty live, so it's for, for, for larger groups. So if we look at some of the part-time calculations, as I was saying before, 30 hours a week or more, um, and basically it's for employers with uh, 50 or more. So if you have, to give you one example, you have two part-time workers will be considered as Wolf one full-time employee. So that's how the calculation is going to be done. Um, so if we look at some examples, if you have a company with 40 full-time employees and they hire 18 part-time employees, each of wh whom works 25 hours per week, it ends up being calculated as 15 full-time employees. Um, so this is also, I think, going to hurt, hurt the part-time market. Um, you know, because as an employer, you have part-time employees, you don't budget for their health insurance. Um, and that's a big cost. You know, you're talking, you know, if you're lucky, three, 400 a month, maybe a, a lot more. You know. Are you willing to pay that fine? Because if you're looking at a fine of 15 employees, um, that's $30,000 a year um, that you haven't budgeted for. To give you some examples, once we start to get to bigger companies, um, if you have 1,000 employees, um, and part of the math uh, you know, uh, is that you subtract 30 employees from the calculation. So if you see 1,000 EE means employee minus 30, it's just that's what the rules are. So if you have 1,000 employees, you're fine if you're not offering insurance to your full-time employees is 161660 a month or the equivalent of $1.9 million per year. If you have 10,000 employees, your fine is $20 million a year for not offering health insurance. If you have 100,000 employees, your fine is $200 million. So this is pretty substantial, especially if you're bigger companies. If you're a company with 100,000 employees, and for some reason you didn't offer benefits because of the work uh, that you had and now you've got to pay a $200 million fine. You've got to find somewhere to make up that money. Um, and one thing that I hope doesn't happen is that this pushes companies to outsource overseas and open operations overseas where they know that you know, they don't have to deal with the mandate because you know, in some countries you, know, you could pay six dollars $900 a month for qualified employees. Um, that makes a big difference. So for any of you that actually wants to look at the story I was just mentioning of the guy who robbed the bank um, for the dollar to get surgery, um, uh, his name was Richard James Verone, and he was 59 years old from to, uh, North Carolina, and there's a link to it. So watch out for 2018. So one of the things that amazes me is some of the things that were put in the law make no sense. 
Um, they, they really don't, and you could in a minute understand that they make no sense. So one of the things Congress did is they created a thing called a Cadillac tax that kicks in place in 2018. And the Cadillac tax, the concept is, if you're paying a very large amount of money for health insurance, it must be because you're rich and you have really great benefits. And they, so they call it the Cadillac tax, like a Cadillac car. And what they set it as in 2018 is if your insurance is $10,200 or more per year as an individual, or $27,500 or more for a family, you're now gonna get hit with a 40% tax. So that's gonna be 4,080 for an individual and 11,000 for family, bringing the coverage up to 14,000 and 38,000. And the, the part that makes no sense is in literally anyone in 30 seconds could look at where insurance rates are today multiply the trend of, of inflation and cost for the next couple years, and you see that the majority of Americans will fall under the Cadillac tax. So they'll get hit with a 40% rate increase, which means their costs are gonna skyrocket and be even more unaffordable, which is an incentive for everyone to really drop off the plan. So the question is, why was this done? You know, I mean, ha you know, obviously, they had to know that this was gonna happen. So, you know, to jump into some slides, you know, regarding back to medical tourism, because really what I wanted to explain is some of the core components of healthcare reform, um, so you can understand of how it's really going to affect cost, because you need to understand that to understand how it's gonna drive innovation in the U.S. marketplace. So for inbound medical tourism patients coming to the U.S., healthcare reform has no effect whatsoever. You know, a lot of U.S. hospitals bring patients from all over the world because of the high quality of healthcare, but they're either cash paying patients or they're covered by a private insurer or a foreign government, and a lot of people are buying insurance policies overseas that they, they, they're global policies. You can go anywhere, so they choose to come to the U.S. for the quality. Um, so they're still gonna come. It, 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 has, it has no effect, it doesn't change anything. Um, and it's gonna continue to grow as more of these global policies uh, grow. Most insurance companies in most developed and developing countries now offer these policies. And you could pay like three different levels of premium, one to stay local in the country, one to go regionally, and one to go, um, to go anywhere. So how does it affect domestic medical tourism? So one of the things that's really taking off is domestic medical tourism, which is um, patients traveling within the U.S., or it could be companies um, sending their employees within the U.S. And it's because of, um, there's two models, high quality, hair, uh, high quality care at more affordable rates, or high quality care at fixed bundled packages. So medical tourism for years has been offering transparent fixed bundle packages. You know what the price is for the surgery. Now U.S. hospitals are starting to do it because they realize, the, I, I think it's the competitive effect of medical tourism. They realize they need to be transparent and give, give bundled pricing. So if we look at two, a couple of those examples, um, Lowe's partnered with the Cleveland Clinic for heart surgeries and it's a fixed rate for procedures and they decided to do it specifically for quality. Um, they knew that if they went to the Cleveland Clinic and they felt they were the best hospital for heart care, they would have better outcomes, which meant less complications. And with the fixed rate, if there were complications, it was covered under the package price. And they, were, they found that employees returned to work faster um, than if they went to a normal average hospital. So they, would, they were covering airfare and hotel and transportation for a patient in the companion. Um, and it's interesting because President Obama actually um, ma made a statement of why people can, why can Americans go to the Cleveland Clinic, one of the top heart hospitals in the country, and get their surgery for less than some of the other U.S. hospitals. There's a major hospital here in South Florida, right here in Miami, where their costs are significantly higher than the Cleveland Clinic. Um, the other example of domestic medical tourism is there are hospitals that are providing high quality care at like half the price of other hospitals. So like an orthopedic surgical center in Orange County, California that's doing knee replacements for 24,000, where the average price at a hospital is 50,000. That's an example of the high, high quality but lower prices. So there was a recent study by a couple of consulting firms and they found it was like one third to one quarter of US employers that we're gonna look at doing direct contracting with providers in the next couple years, which is a very significant number. And it's positive too for, for international medical tourism 
because what it says is that employers understand that they need to look for quality outside of their area and that they're willing to provide incentives to their employees and let them travel and make choices on their own. So one of the reasons why healthcare reform, I believe, is really going to drive medical tourism is costs are going up. I, I don't see how there's no, there's no magic happening here. There's no special bean. Um, like, uh, so how are costs going down? There's, there's nothing to reduce costs. So if costs are going up, it's going to force employers to look at how do we save money. And there's only a couple options. There's consumer-driven health plans, which has been tried for years, and they really haven't seen an effect. Um, you know, costs keep going up. There's corporate wellness, but corporate wellness takes years to implement and get ROI. Medical tourism, I look, as one of the only real true consumer-driven products out there because it's not theoretical and there doesn't need to be a long-term wait for a return on investment. If an employee decides to go for care, the savings is there and it's instant. Um, when I, I was the first one to implement medical tourism in the U.S. and self-funded health plans um, back in 2004, and the first person we had go overseas for care was an employee working for a Miami employer, and they were of Colombian descent, and they said, hey, can we go back to Bogota for surgery? And we paid for their airfare and their hotel, um, and a t it was going to be 20000 here in the U.S., and it cost $2,000. And one of the main reasons they wanted to go back to Colombia was they wanted to recover around their family. Um, so, uh, you know, this is going to be a driver because every big insurer I talk to says, the one thing healthcare reform is going to do is going to drive innovation. And what they mean by drive innovation is everybody's kind of been lazy, you know, over a long period of time. Insurance premiums are going up. They are what they are. The employer pays for it. The individual pays for it. But now everybody realizes costs are unsustainable and they're going to start really going up significantly. And that employers and insurers are going to be forced to do innovative things that they've never done before. And if costs are going to go up, what solutions are out there? And then we also have to look at, in the U.S., we have a very large ethnic population of Asians, Hispanics, and, you know, people from other countries. And Deloitte did a study years ago that found that, like, one-third of Americans, and Gallup did too, one-third of Americans, your average American, would go overseas for high-quality care if, you know, the costs were more affordable for major procedures, cancer, orthopedics, things like that. When they looked at the ethnic segment, they found that almost 50 to 55 percent of Hispanic Americans, of Asian Americans, would travel for care. Why? Because there's no cultural barrier, there's no language barrier. If they have family over there, it's, uh, it's okay for them to, uh, you know, they, they can recover around the family. So we, we look at this as a huge untapped market that's really going to grow. And if any of you would, uh, you know, like more information on this, we um, did a webinar on it. It's going to be very similar to this, and we did about a 20-page white paper on healthcare reform's impact on medical tourism. So it was really, you know, this whole presentation was really to give the idea of, of what healthcare reform really is, how costs are not going to go up or going to go up to actually educate you, since a lot of people just didn't know, um, and so that you can kind of form your own opinion, because I think you're going to see a lot of self-insured employers moving in this direction. And once the law passed, I got a lot of emails and calls from insurance agents and employers that I've worked with in the U.S. market. And the one thing that they said is, this is going to be awesome for your association and this is going to be awesome for the medical tourism industry. Um, you know, and because they know there's nothing else out there that's going to help them. Uh, any questions? Yes. Yes. No, I... Can you want me to repeat it? Oh, okay, absolutely. Um, and does that mic work there? No. Um, so yes, employers um, will be attracted to global coverage. You know, I don't think all employers are. You know, we shouldn't expect all employers um, to be it. You know, but if just a small segment of employers um, do decide to go that route, I think that could be enough to fill a lot of the hospitals out there. Um, you know, and the one thing we have to expect is reasonable expectations. You know, not every, you know, if you offer this within an employer to employees, not every employee is going to be interested in, in going. Um, there's going to be employees who just want to stay at home. 
Um, you know, but uh, it's all about education. I think it's about educating the employer. It's about educating the employee. And that's one of the reasons why we, we focus heavily on the destination guides that we've been doing, because we put them out there for free and we give them to employers, is, is I think there will be greater adoption if you educate these people and they truly understand there's higher quality care or equal quality at more affordable prices. But that's been one of the big, I think, gaps that's happened in the U.S. marketplace so far is there hasn't been a lot of education. Um, you know, from the insurance side, you know, we, you know, doing it for many years, you know, if you don't capture the attention of the human resource manager, the employer, the agent, you're not going to get anyone to travel. And what's happened for a lot of the groups, um, those who've been trying to implement it with employers, is they're getting the employer to sign off on it, but they're giving nothing to the employee to actually educate them on care. And then they're saying, I don't understand why our employees aren't traveling for care. They're getting an incentive, cash, uh, a waiving a deductible, waiving of coinsurance. You know, they might make $5,000 off of it, but it, that's not enough. I mean, if I told you, hey, I can send you to a hospital and you're going to get $5,000 and the care is great, I mean, you're going to say, tell me about the doctor, tell me what the hospital's like. So this is, this is, I think, the big area that as an industry we have to come together. And it's not just for American patients, it's for any patient market that needs to go after Russian patients, um, Middle Eastern patients, Latin American patients. Is there, we, we have to educate and put information together to get people engaged to have trust in the healthcare system. Next question, you had one? I have a quick question. Um, could you speak a little bit about the move away from a fee-for-service compensation to like a fee-for-quality, a fee-for-outcome, your thoughts on those trends? Uh, and speak a little bit more kind of like about the uh, bundled payments rather than the split payments. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, if, if we look at the bundled payment system, I, I think that's a wonderful system because in the U.S. you have no idea what surgery is really going to cost. Um, and it's difficult for insurers and they're even doing healthcare transparency tools where they're trying to show you what it costs at different hospitals. But no, you know, if you ask any insurance carrier employers, it's very difficult to gauge that because it depends on the doctors and there's complications. And the bundled packaging for employers per, and even for insurers, it provides a set price. And I think it actually improves the quality of care because within that bundled package pricing, if it includes complications, the whole thought process behind that is there's a philosophy of doing a multidisciplinary approach where all the doctors and everyone on the team, the anesthesiologists, all work together to make sure that the surgery goes right and there are no complications. Um, because if there's complications and they have to redo the surgery, they're not gonna get compensated for it. So I think it's a very positive, and that also kind of goes towards the quality, um, you know, getting paid pay for, for, uh, for performance. And I know pay for performance is really growing. Um, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's a topic I feel like we could have an hour-long conversation on, so I'd be free to talk on the side, but I, I think that's, it's a great model, too, because we need to, uh, as part of the, any system, not just the U.S., I think any system anywhere in the world, we have to focus on you know, rewarding for better quality and better outcomes. The physicians covering their behind. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, this is this is all comes down to if they get sued and they are in front of the board of Madison and what was done and what was not done. So I don't know where that can go. Yeah. And I'll tell you a short story. Is um, I, I have a friend who's in the insurance industry and I was just speaking in Louisiana on medical tourism to the Health Insurance Underwriters Association. And he also um, is a part owner in a medical malpractice company. And they're actually lobbying the Louisiana legislature to increase the limits of medical malpractice. So I think it was capped at, I don't remember the exact amount, it was capped at $250,000 for lawsuits against doctors. They want to take it to half a million. And you'd say, why would a medical malpractice company want to increase the amount doctors can get sued for? <clears throat> and it's because they had most of the doctors in Louisiana covered and they want to make more money and they want to make more premium. So they're lobbying so that those limits get raised and doctors can get sued um, more. So it's interesting because it's, you know, it's a very difficult system for us to reform because it's not just on a national level, it's on a state level. And there's a lot of political interests involved from, you know, if you saw a lot of the TV 
um, you know, uh, coverage, Fo it doesn't matter, Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, of this, you don't see them at all talking about medical supply companies and the costs and how a U.S. manufacturer makes a knee replacement implant and sells it here for 15000 but sells it in India for 5000 or that you can pick up a prescription drug here for $25 with your copay, with your insurance plan, but get it for like a couple dollars in any other country. Um, you, didn't see, you didn't see him going after the pharmaceutical companies or medical supply or even the insurance companies. And, and you didn't see them telling the story of how in 2020 insurance companies would make more under health care reform than they did today. And then just step back for a second and ask yourself, if you watch any of those major news networks in the U.S., who are their main advertisers? So, you know, pharmaceutical, insurance companies. Yes? Um, and, and what exactly do you mean? You mean like cash paying patients or what do you? Um, I, I mean, I could sit with you and talk, you, talk to you about those. I mean, there's always outside the box things going on with medical tourism. Yes. You mentioned earlier that the companies with uh, more than 50 employees may choose to pay $2,000 fine and then they maybe just say okay I'm gonna pay the fine I think that's an easy problem to fix from the legislature point of view maybe next year they're gonna amend the law it says look one year up to two thousand after one year it's gonna increase to five thousand ten thousand whatever ultimately forcing companies to get the health care what does that mean do you think for the health of the companies like in hospitality industry, I'm sure that you know very well that the profit margins in restaurant industry is 7 to 10 percent, which means that if this is in effect, many of the restaurants will be out of business. Do you see that as, a, as something that's going to come up, or do you think that this is going to be repealed even by Obama, even if Obama was going to be select, elected as a president? Um, you know, I don't think Obama is going to repeal it, and if he gets in a second term, a lot of you know, experts are saying that you know, he might go further with it because he doesn't have to face another election. Um, and and I, don't, I don't think, could be wrong, I don't think we're going to see Romney repeal it. He's talking about repeal, but I've talked to some U.S. Republican congressmen. Um, I did uh, you know, one when I was in Louisiana, and he basically said what you know, the Republicans mean by repeal is repeal specific provisions of the law. Because how do you, how do you repeal the actual law? Because right now, children who have pre-existing conditions are covered by this law. Are you going to say all the sick kids no longer have coverage? Adults who are sick come on January 1st, 2014 and can finally have coverage guaranteed. Um, and are you going to tell all those people who have hope, hey, you don't have this anymore? And there's been so much money spent by insurance companies and everyone reforming and moving forward with this that if you think about it, the insurance companies know how, how they're doing under it, the pharma companies do, and the medical supply, three of the biggest lobbyists, I don't think they're going to take a risk of allowing the Republicans to repeal the whole law because then they won't know what's coming next. So they're kind of safe now, so it makes sense for them to kind of support it um, not changing. Obviously, for those companies that have very little margins, the $2,000 fine by itself is, is a major hit for them that they can't afford. Um, I, I think, you know, if they went to five or 10,000, they could do it. I think that could be a real problem because then I think you know, companies might lay off employees. They might, some of them could go out of business and I think it would become a political issue where everyone would be fighting against the law. Because um, I think they were very critical of the 2,000 because f once it gets to five or 10, then it really becomes unsustainable for a company. Good question. Though. Well, I think we're at our end. And Jonathan will be available for questions and answers outside, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, Jonathan.